Hello, SpongeGex here, and after 15 years of development hell, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is finally here. I still have memories of first hearing about this adaption long ago and being intrigued by what's to come. I remember how articles were saying how it would be a dark and faithful adaption to the original story using the art style of the Grimly version of the book. Uh, so I was so intrigued by this, I even got a used copy of uh, the Grimly print of the book off eBay and got to read the original story for myself. And boy, people aren't kidding when they say the original content of the original story of Pinocchio is dark. It sounds more like an R-rated story compared to the child audience it was intended for. So knowing Del Toro is famous for his dark and twisted imagination, like uh, movies like Pan's Labyrinth and stuff like that, and... There's definitely quite a bit of influence from that with some of the creature designs in this, but I was looking forward to seeing his take on this book in a stop-motion form. But the closer we got to release, I was starting to become a little concerned. I saw it would be getting a PG rating instead of the PG-13 or R rating many were theorizing it would be getting, and the fact the movie is now a musical and contains themes of anti-fascism and anti-war, it was... Here where I thought, um, this is no longer a faithful adaption of the original story, is it? And, um, I don't know, a part of me kind of wishes it stayed that way. Um, in the end, though, I did enjoy the film, but a part of me wishes it stuck closer to the original story. Overall, this movie is getting very good reception, sitting at 95% on Rotten Tomatoes, with an 85% audience score. While I did enjoy the movie, I don't think it's as great as people are making it out to be. Like, some people are saying this is a perfect film, a flawless film, best adaption of Pinocchio ever. I wouldn't go that far. I still like the Disney, the original Disney version a lot better. But I will say, out of all the Pinocchio adaptions released between the past four years, at least, this is no doubt the best film of that story. Many were bashing the live-action remake of Disney's Pinocchio long before either of these two Pinocchio films released. And everyone was praising Del Toro's, claiming it's more faithful to the original story. But is it really? While it's dark like the original, this one barely follows the plot of the original. And I remember, like, uh, they were trying to say, like, how this book would bring it back to, like, the dark roots of the original story. And I don't know, I still think the original story is a little bit darker. I felt like the, the so-called attempts at being dark in this movie felt incredibly forced, where I felt like in the original story, the dark scenes had a purpose to them to try to teach kids a lesson. I didn't feel so much of in this verse. I felt like it was just being dark for the sake of being dark. But And then, um, this, this just barely follows the plot of the original, for that matter. Um, it even takes a lot of inspiration from things that the Disney cartoon came up with, stuff that wasn't in the original book, necessarily, but the Disney version introduced, like having the cricket be a main character um, and be a bit of a conscience role, or a narrator role, or the side plot of Pinocchio becoming an actor in a puppet show. That stuff was not in the original story. The cricket got killed long at like, in the original book, the cricket got killed, like, shortly after his introduction, so it was kind of shocking how the Disney version made him a secondary main character, you know, and so these elements were not in the book and were pure fabrications of the Disney classic. So, it, it just seems kind of strange how Del Toro seems so determined that his adaption would be more faithful to the book than um, the original Disney take. And, yeah, it's ironic and hypocritical that he copied some elements that you would only find in the Disney version. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of strange. There are a lot of scenes from the book that are missing or rewritten entirely in Del Toro's adaption, including some of the most pivotal moments in Pinocchio's development, like the infamous donkey transformation sequence. The movie is roughly two hours long. I thought the first half of the movie was better. Um, I thought as the movie kept going, it got kind of worse, to be honest. Um, the movie opens up with Geppetto mourning the loss of his son, Carlo, as our cricket character, Sebastian, tells us the story. Unlike the live-action Disney Pinocchio remake that had a very similar premise in the opening, this version does admittedly a much better job at showing Geppetto's life with his son, and even flat out showing the tragedy of how Carlo died to begin with. The movie did a great job at giving Geppetto his own character and arc, instead of just being the father figure who disappears for most of the story like every other adaption. The first eight minutes focus on Geppetto's happy life of a son, as he tells him bedtime stories with life lessons, or shares his love of wood carving with his excited young son. The two were also churchgoers, and Geppetto was hired to make the crucifix for the church. But one day, the effects of war strike, and um, planes end up bombing the church. 
Geppetto survived, but Carlo did not. The way Pinocchio was made in this version was quite an interesting take, and explains why this new version of Pinocchio has a bit of a creepier, more splintery looking design. And So when Carlo died, he was holding a pine cone, which Geppetto buried next to Carlo's grave. Over the years, it grew into a pine tree, obviously foreshadowing events to come. One night when Geppetto visits his son's grave, he gets drunk and starts crying. Out of a fit of rage against God for letting this happen to his son, Geppetto chops down the tree and decides he's going to make his own son out of this tree. And So Sebastian the Cricket happened to be um, inside the tree at the moment, and that was his new home. And he made himself at home right before he discovered Geppetto and before Geppetto chopped it down. So the Cricket gets dragged into Geppetto's home as he drags the wood home. And... So, yeah, basically Pinocchio was made out of a drunken, enraged state. That, that was pretty different, and it, it kind of helped complement why Pinocchio looks so crude in this version. I kind of thought it was interesting. Um, it, it's, it's like it's both kind of sad and funny at the same time, you know. But So very similar to the Disney adaption, a fairy appears and brings Pinocchio to life and entrusts the cricket to look after him. Again, elements that weren't in the original story, Disney version only, but whatever. So, I can see why this adaption borrows so much from Disney, though, because as beloved as the original book is, a lot of stuff happens in the story with no good explanation. Uh, Pinocchio was actually alive before he was carved into a puppet, for example. So, Disney was the first adaption to add more of a whimsical, magical charm to the story. It's honestly hard to go back to the original story without comparing to all the improvements the Disney version made. So, while the fairy in this version is clearly inspired by the blue fairy from the original stories, she is given the name Forest Spirit in this film, and does not have a reoccurring role throughout. In the original story, she kept crossing paths with Pinocchio, and basically became a mother figure to him, trying to shape him into the young man he is destined to become. But in this version, she doesn't show up until towards the end of the film. Speaking of which, the cricket was missing through a huge chunk of the movie as well, despite being set up as the narrator and companion character during the earliest chunks of the film. And I just find it kind of unfair how everyone is bashing the live-action Disney remake for these kind of flaws, yet no one has the nerve to call out this version for making the exact same mistakes. I mean, despite how this is a better film than the Disney live-action remake, though, it still has some of the same mistakes as the live-action Disney remake, and no one has the nerve to call this out on it just because, oh, it was made in stop-motion. And I don't know, sometimes you gotta take off, you know, sometimes you gotta be fair. <laughs> so, aside from Pinocchio and Geppetto, most of the characters in this version were very forgettable and very unnecessary to the story. Nowhere near as memorable as the characters from the original Disney cartoon, at least. This movie is also a musical, which I felt was very unnecessary. Most of the songs did fit the film naturally, though. Most were sung by Pinocchio or Geppetto, and were mostly brought up in context to fit with the story, whether it was Geppetto singing Carlo a lullaby or Pinocchio performing acts in a puppet show. But then you have a few songs that come out of nowhere without any exposition, like uh, Pinocchio's uh, song, like his first song when he comes to life, um, Basically feels like a parody of What's This from Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, Pinocchio just running around uh, questioning what everything is. And then, um, of course, there's the painful villain song. One thing this and the live-action remake of Disney's Pinocchio have in common, some of the worst parts of the films are when the villains sing. So, um, actually, the honor to worst song in this film might be one of the last songs in the film. There comes a point where Pinocchio tries sabotaging a puppet show, and he decides to sing a song about... Poop. I'm not joking. This is in the film. I get that it's during a part where Pinocchio is trying to get back at the villain for lying to him, so he tries to humiliate him in the most embarrassing way possible, but still, it's a scene where Pinocchio keeps singing the words poop one after the other. It doesn't change the fact that this scene exists, and we are forced to suffer for it. So, otherwise, most of the songs were harmless, and Pinocchio's actor did a fine job singing them, as did Geppetto's voice actor. There's a running gag where the cricket tries having his own song number, only for it to get interrupted twice. Then, only during the credits do we finally get to hear a song, and it's honestly the best song in the film. Otherwise, the songs aren't very memorable, and won't be stuck in your head like some of the songs from the Disney classic. I did get a laugh out of the scene where Geppetto first discovers Pinocchio came to life. It was funny how it was shot like a monster flick, with like a Pinocchio up in the attic, and Geppetto having to go up there, and you know, you see him like crawling around like an alien, and the, he just moves so wobbly and unnaturally. Uh, 
but then mixed with his playful innocence and destructive behavior. This film did have a few good laughs, especially due to the film's wonderful animation. Uh, the set pieces in this film were also very well made. So, Pinocchio is treated more like a Frankenstein's monster in this film, minus the angry mobs, but uh, when the town first discovers him, they are terrified of him, rightfully so, and think he's made of witchcraft or something, and kind of, of interesting to see an adaption where the town overreacts to something as mind-blowing as a puppet moving without a puppeteer. It's like in most adaptions of the story, people are kind of shocked by it at first, or people are accepting of it at first, and so this is one where, like... I don't think it was very natural, though. The shock of horror doesn't play much of a role in this film. It's like, uh, it feels so drawing that first scene, like, everyone's terrified of him, and then for the rest of the film, it's like, people are okay with it all of a sudden. It doesn't take long for most everyone to just ignore Pinocchio, except for our film's two villains. So, the original story had a number of villains, including the Cat and the Fox, Fire Eater, or Stromboli, as he's called in the Disney version. And then there's the book-exclusive um, antagonists, like the Fisherman, uh, the Giant Snake, or um, then, of course, there's the Coachman. So, this movie somehow has less villains, and most of them don't reflect the villains from the other adaptions well at all. In fact, according to the documentary on Netflix about the film's development, it is confirmed that the film's main villain is a replacement for the character Fire Eater. And, in fact, there was original concept art that flat-out showed, like, Fire Eater um, throwing Pinocchio off a cliff, and um, that did not end up in the final product. It, it some, like, that scene somehow made it in, but with a lot of alterations. I'll get to that later. But, while I do agree with Del Toro that Fire Eater was a very pathetic villain in the original story, that doesn't explain why he didn't just rewrite him to be a better villain. It's like he had the right design to be a good villain. I'll even say his design was better than the villain we got, but... Um, like, the, the new villain we got is a very scrawny man, um, compared to, um, Fire Eater or Straw Boy, who's, like, this big, you know, bearded man, and, but in the original story of Pinocchio, Pinocchio crashes a puppet show when he meets other puppets like him. Fire Eater is about to throw Pinocchio into a fire, until Pinocchio starts crying, pleading for his life, and starts crying about how his poor father would be without him, and so for some reason, Fire Eater keeps sneezing whenever he feels sorry for someone, and... He eventually lets Pinocchio go and gives him um, a few pieces of gold um, along the way. And so, yeah, not a very good villain. It's like deep down he was a real softy. But yeah, the scene just dragged on and it feels very awkward. It just makes you appreciate how much better Stromboli was as a villain in comparison. But So Del Toro really felt like this new villain was the right move for the story and even demoted the original design of Fire Eater to be a background carnival worker instead. The new villain looks more like a personified version of the Fox character, who unfortunately is missing in this story, along with his cat sidekick, but or cat friend, whatever. But So, we don't get the side plot of the Field of Miracles, or Pinocchio getting chased by the cat and fox dressed as bandits, or anything like that, so kind of unfortunate. The new villain also gets a monkey sidekick for some reason, for some reason voiced by Kate Blanchett, despite how it just makes monkey noises. Kind of embarrassing, but she desperately wanted a role in that movie, and she settled for the monkey, apparently. But the behind-the-scenes feature for this movie tries so hard talking like the monkey and the new villain were such crucial characters to this movie. It wouldn't have worked without him, and I'm just shaking my head like, what are you talking about? The villains were some of the weakest parts of this movie. <laughs> so uh, they were trying to make them so dark for the sake of shock value, it misses the point of the villains in the first place. In every other adaption of Pinocchio, the villains were used as a cautionary tale to teach kids a lesson about the dangers of temptations, talking to strangers, and that nothing comes for free. So we got the new villain who was a mixture of the fox and Stromboli, basically. He tricks Pinocchio into being a performing slave for his puppet show. He promises to give Pinocchio's earnings to his father, only to learn later on that the villain wasn't even giving any of the money back to Geppetto. He was lying to him. So... I don't know, these villains are mostly so forgettable and they don't get interesting until, like, um, moments before their demise, basically. It's like, out of nowhere, like, the further the movie goes, all out of nowhere, they just become more darker and meaner. It's like they all of a sudden become serial killers, and it's like there was no hint of this earlier on in the movie. So, I don't know, I, th I thought it felt incredibly forced. Usually for a villain like this to work, you gotta show a better transition into them going this mad or not just have it come out of the blue, you know? It's like, yeah, at first they were jerks, they were liars, they were mean, but it's like, 
Some of this stuff just came out of nowhere. I can't even remember the names of the villains in this movie. They're so forgettable. Like, just one dealing of the Disney version from Pinocchio as a kid. I remember those villains for life, but none of these at all. So, it's like the only character name I can remember in this is Sebastian Cricket. And not because he is memorable, but just because he is probably the easiest name to remember. But So, the other villain in the story feels like a replacement for the Coachman. He's a military instructor who wants to draft Pinocchio into a war since we learned that Pinocchio is indestructible. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Pinocchio is immortal in this film, and dies at numerous times. Every time he dies, he's seen uh, being dragged down to the underworld by these creepy black rabbits. A nice reference to a scene in the original book where Pinocchio refused to take his medicine until these black rabbits came in with a coffin threatening to take him away unless he takes it, so... Uh, here, Pinocchio meets the devil, who was the sister of the forest fairy. Uh, so it kind of implies that the forest fairy is kind of like an angel, I guess. Um, and then, So you'd think the devil would be a villain in this story, but she really isn't. In fact, she's kind of like um, a moral compass for Pinocchio during a few scenes. And she points out how Pinocchio can't really die and will always return back to the surface world. But um, every time he dies, he'll have to stay in the underworld a little longer than the last. Um, so it's almost like a timeout, you know, a timeout that gets longer every time he's sent back there. Now, um, Pinocchio has a lot of questions for her, but every time he tries, um, getting answers from her, his time runs out and he ends up revived back on the surface. I thought this was a neat idea, it kind of reminded me of the comical death scene from Conker's Bad Fur Day with Conker and Greg the Grim Reaper. Um, where a death-like figure feels inconvenienced by a creature that can basically cheat through death and, you know, it makes their job more difficult. Again, this is a fun idea and felt like a neat way to replace the running occurrence of Pinocchio's punishments. So, for those who don't know, in the original story of Pinocchio, which started off as a series of short stories made for a newspaper, the author Carlo Collodi hated kids and wanted to make a story that would scare them straight. He had the original story end with Pinocchio being hung from a tree by the cat and fox, as Pinocchio was forced to reflect on how awful of a boy he was while he dies. So... Okay, there are many reasons why this ending is messed up. Not only for being so needlessly dark, but also because... How is a creature made of wood supposed to die from a hanging? I mean, what the heck? But that's beyond the point. Either way, people weren't too happy with this abrupt ending and wanted the story to continue. Collodi agreed to continue the story, but only on the condition that Pinocchio's punishments for his naughty behavior would be worse than the last. Um, before he gets his happy ending, at least. So... Del Toro's version of the film seemed to have an interesting way to deal with Pinocchio's punishments. He flat out dies, uh, but because he's immortal, he will return. But, however, the fact he'll have to wait longer before recovering, that could have been an interesting idea. However, his, his time is always short. He's barely down there very long, and he only dies three times in the movie, need I remind you. So, um... I don't know, it felt kind of jarring how, like, after the second time he dies, he's acting like he's died many times already. He's, like, laughing at the idea at how, like, death doesn't affect him, you know, and... I don't know, I felt like that should have been played out... Like, they should have flat out had a montage of him constantly dying, and... Heck, maybe even have, like, a dark joke where he's, like, flat out killing himself knowing that he would be fine. And, you know, uh, basically, what would a kid do if they learned they could die and not have any consequences? I thought that would have been kind of a dark, twisted way of you know, a dark, humorous way of dealing with that, but, um, the, the movie just would have felt more effective if it had more scenes of him dying, and every time he dies, we see him, uh, struggling or suffering from the effects of being down there longer than the last, to the point where, instead of just being down there for seconds, he's down there for hours or something, you know, and it actually gives him time to finally sit down and reflect on what he's been doing wrong, encouraging him to be better, and, um, so, yeah, this could have worked as a better replacement for the Blue Fairy's original role, and could have given more natural growth for Pinocchio to learn from his mistakes. Um, but, I don't know, it just, it felt like an, a neat idea, but the movie just keeps rushing these scenes, it ruins the impact they could have had. So, okay, a little sidetrack there, but anyways, back to the military instructor villain. He also turns out to be the father of Candlewick, or Lamplick as he was called in the Disney version. Yes, the kid Pinocchio befriends and gets turned into a donkey. Well, not in this version, at least. There is no Land of Toys, Booby Land, Pleasure Island, or whatever any other adaption calls that dreaded place. The scene is replaced with Pinocchio and Candlewick being drafted into a war and get sent into a training facility. 
So uh, Pinocchio and Candlewick grow a friendship there, and they can really relate to, you know, not being what their fathers expect of them and um, just wanting to be themselves. So that's something that they can bond over. And so despite how one of the training exercises pits them against each other as enemies... Like, they're supposed to basically, um, like, mount, like, their side's flag, like, up on, um, a little, of uh, you know, basically a flag stand, I guess. But, um, instead of, um, overpowering each other, they decide to work together and hang both of their flags up, kind of, like, symbolizing peace, you know. But, of course, the instructor is not happy about that. He thinks, like, that's a weakness. So, he hands Candlewick a gun and forces him to shoot Pinocchio. Again, this scene feels dark and forced for the sake of it, and... Okay, it just doesn't make sense either way. For one, we both know that the Sarge and Pinocchio know that he will survive this. We've seen it, like, two times already in this film. They already know that Pinocchio won't die from this, so um, either, Pinocchio will just be revived from it. But it, it still feels like a complete waste of time. They're trying to make the scene feel so dramatic, like Lampwick can't shoot Pinocchio, despite how they all know, oh, he's going to be fine. But it just feels like a waste of time regardless, trying to force your own son to shoot down a fellow soldier. The one, you know, isn't that the point of war? Working with your fellow brothers in arms to take down the enemy to defend your country? So what is the point? How did this guy become a sergeant? It makes no sense. So Candlewick refuses, which enrages the instructor further. However, as this happens, um, warplanes drop by and they start bombing the base. But even as this is going on, the sergeant isn't focused on wanting to evacuate. He's, he just wants his son to flat out shoot Pinocchio in the face. It makes no sense. It's like, where are your priorities, man? They just made this guy a sadist for no reason. And so, yeah. It, so eventually Candlewick ends up shooting his dad, but with a paint gun instead of a real gun. And this somehow causes him to stumble backwards, get tangled up in a net, which leaves him trapped. And a bomb strikes directly onto him and he dies. The, uh, yeah, this part felt incredibly dark and forced for no reason. Um, and the, apparently the blast sent Pinocchio flying. It's shown that Candlewick is fine, although that is the last we see of him in this film. Uh, well, he was spared a worse fate compared to what he got in other adaptions of this story, I guess. But, so, then out of nowhere, the puppeteer villain catches up with Pinocchio and tries getting revenge on him. Now... This is just, this just kind of made me facepalm. It's like, how? what are the odds? Like, yeah, I get that Pinocchio was blown away by an explosion, but I don't think the explosion sent him that far that he somehow ended up exactly where the other villain was. Like, what was the other villain doing um, near, like, um, the training base of a military? It makes no sense. Like, it's implied that they were shipped off to war. Like, this base is, like, you know, like, on a farther part of Italy. So, I just found this completely inconvenient. It was just a lame way to... Try to kill off all the villains at once, it feels like. I don't know. This just felt so stupid. So, um... Now, it's interesting to know that according to early concept art for the scene, there was a picture where it showed Fire Eater throwing Pinocchio and his monkey henchmen off a cliff into the sea. Pinocchio was shown with his donkey ears and a tail, similar to how he escaped um, from getting a full transformation in the Disney version. So... It implies that the Land of Toys plot was intended for the film at one point, but somewhere down the line it was dropped. So, I don't know how you can scrap one of the most important and haunting aspects of the original book and replace it with a stupid war segment that goes nowhere. This entire segment felt incredibly forced. It leads into another forced and rushed scene. It felt like, like I said, it felt like they just, um were running out of time, they had to come up with a way to get rid of the villains in a gruesome way, and they just kill them both off one after the other. And so, the puppeteer um, is mad at Pinocchio for ruining his act, and he uh, ties him up and is about to burn him to a stake, but then his monkey actually stands up for Pinocchio, who, in return, stood up for him earlier. And so, um, the monkey attacks his master, and um, both of them start fighting until they roll off a cliff, basically, and... The puppeteer dies a very gruesome death by landing on a big sharp rock, and there's no blood or dismemberment shown, but it was still shocking to see his lifeless body just, like, land um, hard on the rock, and you actually hear, like, his bones crunch, and they flat out show the impact. Like, it doesn't cut away, you flat out see and hear the impact. Um, so, kind of shocking, but, again, it just felt like it was being dark for the sake of it. It didn't necessarily feel earned. Now, I've always wanted to see an adaption of Pinocchio where the villains get a well-deserved punishment, but this was just overkill. 
it just felt so forced and rushed. Um, but, I mean, well, yeah, these characters did deserve a punishment, but they were mostly boring, plain-of-the-mill villains, and it's not until, like, near their death scene where all of a sudden they act like real monsters, and then they get immediately killed after they show some psychotic tendencies. It just felt forced for the sake of being dark. I don't know. So, somehow the monkey survived this fall, as it abruptly cuts the Pinocchio and the monkey just drifting through the sea, which leads to the terrible dog shark segment. And, God, I, I still, uh, it's funny how I feel like only the Disney version of this story actually did a good job transitioning into the Monstro story. Um, there's something more entertaining about that underwater segment, um, where in the, any other version of the story, it just happens, like, shortly after the, um, Basically, um, after P uh, Pinocchio gets turned back into a human after the donkey transformation, um, he somehow ends up in the sea and gets immediately eaten by the dog shark. Um, so yeah, for those who are confused, in the Disney version, it was a whale named Monstro, but in the original book and other adaptions, it was a giant dog shark. So, or the, the, the terrible dogfish, as some would call it. So, basically, all that was just a setup for Pinocchio to finally get eaten by the dog shark, which leads to him reuniting with Geppetto, yada yada, um... So, I think that's as far as I'll go with spoiling the story, because the ending, um, uh, the ending, you gotta see it for yourself. It's not quite what I was expecting from a Pinocchio story. It's quite honestly a bit of a downer of an ending as well, and again, I think, um, for an adaption that they claim was trying to be faithful to the original, I feel like the ending of this really goes against the ending of the original. And I'll even say the, re the Disney live-action remake, as abrupt and infamous as its ending was, I'll even say that was slightly more faithful to the original. And so it's like this is an adaption that's trying to fool with your expectations. Like, oh, you've seen and heard this story before, so we're going to change it for the sake of it. But let's try to do it in the most downer way possible. And so, yeah, the, the ending would definitely not sit well with kids or overprotective parents. I don't think, um, like, I can definitely see those who appreciate, like, an artful story liking it. But I don't know. It's hard to say who this movie was made for. Like, early on, this movie was worded like it was made for adults. But the marketing and PG rating it ended up getting really made it seem more like it was going to be more for kids. And so, the movie has a mixture of lighter and more whimsical scenes with, um, during the first half at least. But it gets downright depressing and dark um, the further it gets to the ending. Closer it gets to the ending, I mean. And I can kind of see why this film was so hard to market in the first place why they had trouble getting someone to actually fund this to begin with. Despite how Netflix finally picked it up, they honestly aren't doing a good job with it. Barely any promotions for the film, and despite being released today, it was not under the new release banner or anything, and I had to physically search for it on the search bar just for this film to show up. Even the poster art for it didn't feel like it was trying to draw people in, so... It's just not doing anything to grab people's attention, for those who've never heard of this. Um, it is a shame the film turned out the way it did. Like, it was originally meant for theaters. It had a hard-working crew behind it who fought, like, over a decade to get this thing finally moving. And, yeah, it gets dumped onto and ignored by Netflix. So, I don't even see others talking about this film. Even those who were dead set on, you know, people who have been, like, anticipating this film, hyping this film, uh, shaming Disney's live-action remake and while praising this at the same time, despite how neither of the films came out yet. So, um, yeah, I don't know. For all the hype this movie was getting, it's not getting much reception, despite the good reviews and all that. Um, despite how it's reviewing well, it's just not getting much attention anywhere. I do think the movie is still worth watching, though. I still feel a little underwhelmed by what could have been, but... Um, I'm still able to look back at how exciting the speculation for this film was when it was supposed to be a film adaption of the Grimly version of this book, yet um, it seems like only Pinocchio and Fire Eater are the only characters in that um, story to still re retain the Grimly designs. The rest of the illustrations or movie designs don't really reflect the book at all, so I would have loved to have seen other scenes from the book reanimated and retold in a more cinematic way. Unfortunately, the movie couldn't make up its mind. Um, whether it wanted to be um, a retelling of the original story, take elements from other Pinocchio adaptions, or just tell its own story. And the end product just feels kind of messy. It's a good mess, though, but part of me just wanted a better revised version of the original story. And 
While the film does look great, there are still too many iconic scenes and characters from the original book that are missing, which kind of hinders it kind of hinders the final product and kind of misses the point of what the original story was. So, again, I don't see why people are bashing Disney for not being faithful to the original story when this movie is honestly no better. I do agree that this film is in fact better than the Disney remake, but um, not for the hypocritical reasons others are making it out for. So, um, I still think the Disney classic is the better version, though, but um, this film did come close in some aspects. There were some real interesting ideas and thought-provoking moments. I liked the exploration into Geppetto's struggle of losing a son, making a new one, and feeling disappointed that the new son isn't like his old one, or I liked the struggle of Pinocchio wanting his dad to like him, wanting to fit in with others, and uh, I just felt like it didn't uh, focus enough on these struggles, and... Most of the movie instead just focuses on Pinocchio running away with the puppeteer villain instead. The moments between Pinocchio and Geppetto were the best parts of the film. There was a lot of heart in them. And um, I really like the part where Pinocchio stares at the crucifix of Jesus and questions why others love that guy and not me. Pinocchio points out how both are made of wood, yet nobody loves him. Everyone loves Jesus, but no one loves him. And... Now, this part was artistically brilliant, not only in showcasing Pinocchio's struggle to want to be liked and accepted, but also a good possible reference to blind religion. Like how some people only follow the words of Christ or the church just because they were raised to, um, and if they try questioning to, they'll get shamed for it or something. And so, um, I don't know, I just uh, it just causes people to just do as they're told and not bother questioning why, and... Sometimes a dangerous way of thinking. So, the scene did a great job at portraying a controversial topic, but showing it through the innocence of a child who isn't quite human, but wants to be treated as such. So, while this is a mixed story, I can't say I disliked the movie. I didn't love it either, though, but I definitely liked it more than I disliked it. So, it was still amazing to look at, I just wish the storytelling was better. Um, was it really worth the long wait of development? I really don't know. I mean, 15 years was quite a long wait, and I can't say um, the end product was as exciting as just the news of hearing about this as it was 15 years ago, but not quite the movie I was hoping for, but I can't deny the passion, hard work, the artists and crew put into the film. It's safe to say that this is indeed the best adaption of the three Pinocchio films we got in 2022. Well, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you for watching. See you next time, and have a great day.